Welcome to Courageous and Just Conversations on Faith in Challenging Times. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary and Theologian in Residence at Trinity Church Wall Street, both in New York City. I am here today in Denver at St. John's Cathedral with the Reverend Mihi Kim Court, a minister and leader in the Presbyterian Church and the author of a new book, Outside the Lines, How Embracing Queerness Will Transform Your Faith. Welcome, Mihi, and thank you for joining me in this conversation. The pleasure is all mine. It's wonderful to be here with you. I am struck by how, in fact, vulnerable you make yourself in this book and how you, much you share with us about your personal story. So what inspired you to write this book? When I had, uh, had started this conversation with Fortress Press about um, doing a book around queerness and thinking about specifically the stories of Jesus, but they were looking for something different. They wanted something that would be more accessible to the broader audience. And so as I continued to engage uh, the subject matter um, and specifically think about queerness, um, I, I realized how much this became um, an opportunity to delve into my own personal history. And so um, I'm super inspired by many queer artists and uh, um, uh, writers, um, folks who have dealt with a similar sort of history and process. Um, and there's a film director, a Korean American named Andrew Ahn, who's mm. based out in LA. And he um, shared uh, once about his um, sort of process of coming out as well. And he talked about how he actually came out to his parents through his artwork, um, through his uh, short films, his documentaries. Um, and so I felt like this was an opportunity um, for me to delve into what was more authentic to me. And so I took this as an opportunity to quote unquote, come out. Um, and so it did become very personal. Um, and I felt like being able to sort of mine and delve into my own life would make uh, the subject of queerness um, more, uh, like less intimidating and less sort of theoretical and abstract, but, but rooted in the flesh and blood and rooted in someone's story. Let's begin with queer. What, what, do, what do you mean by this? So when I moved to Bloomington with my family, we moved there um, for my husband's job. Um, I'm a Presbyterian minister and so is he. Uh, we um, went to Bloomington for his job and uh, we had two young, 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 young children. They were babies at the time. And so um, I ended up, uh, to keep myself busy and mentally stimulated, I ended up auditing some gender studies courses at Indiana University, which is um, uh, the school in town. And so um, that just blew the doors wide open for me in terms of language around, um, not just around gender and sexuality, but um, more broadly speaking about identity. Um, and so I could think about race in these terms as well. And so queerness for me became um, very liberative. Um, there was something super magical about um, this sort of feeling of wholeness and coming uh, closer to, uh, a sort of a step closer to myself um, in, to, in terms of being um, more genuinely who I am. Um, of course, that's complicated as I am married to a cisgendered heterosexual man, um, uh, still very much in love with and committed to him, committed to our life together and our family. And I've been in conversation with um, various folks who identify as queer and who uh, theorize queerness as well, that there is, there is some tension with trying to categorize, to try to sort of define, uh, put some bounds around queerness, um, because it's supposed to be anti-assimilationist, that it, it's rooted in um, a, a lot of scholars' sort of um, impetus towards being non-assimilationist um, and non-normative. And so um, I know that there's, there's, um, there's a little bit of contradiction there, um, but I find that tension to still be productive and meaningful. And so for me, it's, it's constantly thinking outside of the bounds, constantly thinking outside the lines. I mean, what does it mean to enflesh that um, in our very lives, in our relationships, in our communities? Um, and so queerness is, uh, queerness is, 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 is an experience of redemption, of grace, of justice. Um, but it's, it's complicated and it's messy, um, and I appreciate that. What are the lines? And so is there an assumption of what is inside the lines? So um, I was really influenced by uh, Michelle de Sarteau's, um The Practice of Everyday Life. And so um, to think about all the structures in our life that are sort of unspoken in our givens, all the scripts that we're given that tell us um, 
you know, what it means to be a grown up, what it means to be an adult, what you're supposed to do、um, after you go to college and get a job, you get married and you have children. I mean, so. So, I, I'm thinking about the ways that we、um, employ certain tr- strategies, the sort of stuff of everyday, ordinary life,、um, to think about、um, and to imagine a spirituality that helps us to live、um, with strategies of resistance, with strategies of survival, but also through strategies of flourishing. So, the stuff that's inside、um, within those sort of categories、um, are, is pretty much anything that I feel like. Is oppressive, that, that binds people,、um, that makes people、um, disconnected from who they truly are、um, and makes them disconnected from their communities. So,、um, so, anything that I think ultimately that elides what it means to be the beloved of God and how that's worked out in relationship and community,、um, that to me is,、uh, is the project that I'm, I'm、um, always thinking about and interested in. And, and, and the way that、um, queerness helps me to,、um, to resist. Resist those things that are within those lines.、Um, and to think about how outside the lines,、um, once we move past those categories and those definitions,、um, anything is possible. Yeah, I identify as a Korean American, I identify as a woman, I identify as a mother and a pastor.、Um, but as soon as those are、um, the only ways that people interact with me, if those are the only ways, those are the only lines, then,、um, then I feel restricted. And then I feel like, Um, something is missing, something is lacking. And it goes you know, the same for those who I interact with.、Um, and I have a tendency to do that as well. I mean, I think that we've just been conditioned by these systems and these structures、um, of power,、um, of hierarchy, of patriarchy, that,、um, that try to put us into these roles and make us、um, be and live out、um, a, a certain sort of function、mm-hmm. um, in order to sort of perpetuate these systems. So、in my mind, I'm thinking about、uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, and he talks about life behind the veil, right? And he asks this question can we, and he's speaking, of course, in terms of African Americans, is there possibility of living your life when it is not in any way defined by the veil, which means that you aren't living in relationship, living into what that veil means of whiteness, but you also are not living over and against it so that you're, you're just living. Living you.、Yeah. And so you are, the veil's not there. How do you take the veil away? <laughs> I think that's, I mean, I think that that is something that I'm still working on. I mean, I think that、um, Du Bois' s double consciousness is, is very present in so many,、um, in so many experiences,、um, or it feels, it feels very palatable to a lot of experiences、um, in terms of that veil.、Um, and I think that、uh, I'm, I'm a little influenced as well by Saba Mahmood, her、mm-hmm. um, politics of piety, and, and how we're constantly being defined. In terms of、um, our personhood and our subjecthood and our agency by resistance. Like, if we're not、um, up against a system then, and, and,、um, and shaping our lives and forming our lives around some kind of resistance, then are we really、um, employing or enacting or embodying agency? And so I think there's something there that's useful for how we. Live out、um, some of some, this notion of queerness. And so、um, I think that that veil is present.、Um, I think that that veil will always be present, and we're going to be interacting with and engaging it、um, to、uh, a certain degree.、Um, I think because I have this, this、um, idea,、uh, this sort of, sort of very broad idea about eschatology, and, and feel like、um, not until some of these things are. Totally gone, are we ever going to come face to face with、um, who we fully and really are?、Um, and that's, that's sort of my kind of double like mourning and hope <laughs> at the yeah, same yeah, time. Yeah.、Um, uh, but we can come close. And so,、uh, so I just I think about like the everyday stuff of、um, parenting my children.、Mm-hmm. And so some of the ways that we try to、um, get rid of those scripts, those norms,、mm-hmm. is、um, we, we don't focus on gender. We、mm-hmm. don't focus on particular gender representations. And I talk about that a little bit in、yes. the book in terms of colors. And、yeah, I want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.、Um, and now, actually, my daughter really hates purple and pink. So <laughs> we've gone the opposite direction with that. But to even think about things around. Around、um, uh, marriage and intimacy,、um, we don't talk in those terms.、Mm-hmm. Um, as in, like, someday when you're married, or someday when you meet the person that you fall in love with, or someday when you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, we don't even talk in those terms.、Um, because we want there to be, we want to be able to somehow 
present to them and embody the possibility of something more than what is in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's, that's queerness too, is gesturing towards something, mm -hmm. towards some horizon behind, beyond the lines that is not yet experienced, but always still there. Um, and that hopefully we're either um, expanding our uh, experiences and our relationships so that we are able to, to begin to gesture or move towards that horizon. But what struck me in that, because I remember this same experience uh, with my son, that try as I might not to have any sort of gendered, uh, specific sort of realities and try to live outside, as you would say, the lines of gender constructions, if lo and behold, he didn't come home from school one day and touting how he hated pink yeah. because uh, that was so girly. Uh, the, I'm like, where did he get that? So, but that's in the marrow of, of our nation and, and it's in the air. And so how, how do you disrupt yeah. those discourses of this kind of normativity. Yeah, I mean, that's that really is a challenge, isn't it? I mean, I think there's something about um, we as parents, we can embody it in a certain way. Um, our communities, um, if we're all on the same page and encouraging a particular kind of masculinity, um, like for instance, with Desmond, he has a really wonderful group of um, guy friends. Mm -hmm. um, they've known and loved each other since kindergarten. Granted, they're only in second grade, so it's only been a couple of years. Um, but we can wait till third grade. They won't anymore. <laughs> Well, right now, we continue to hear stories from teachers and from parents about um, that they are just so emotionally vulnerable with each other. They're sensitive. They're, they're constantly taking care of each other. They'll cry in front of each other and, and um, receive comfort from each other. And there's something so um, counter uh, to the norm uh, about those tiny little experiences. I mean, it might just be because they're kids, and this is this is kind of what happens at this age. Um, but then again, I, I love to think about the queerness of children and what they can teach us about that. Um, but so things like that, where there are um, experiences that allow for a different experience um, and expression of masculinity. Um, and my husband is super in touch with his emotions, and um, he is very vulnerable and authentic in that. Um, and so I feel like that's being modeled within the community. Um, and so if our churches can do the same, you know, um, so I'm not even saying like our churches are necessarily modeling that, unfortunately, but um, the community of families around um, these boys and these children, um, if we're all on the same page in terms of lifting up um, certain uh, experiences that are human experiences that aren't particular or representative of one gender, of one sexuality, um, then I think there's there's some possibility, there's some hope there for sure. Um, but it's a struggle. So what is this horizon that you're talking about? Where do you get that? What's the queer horizon look like? I'm thinking about futurity and how that's present um, in our ordinary and everyday lives. Mm -hmm. um, how can we embody and in flesh, in the flesh and blood, in our bones and marrow, um, what it means to live in such a way that um, the possibility of that full freedom, that full restoration, that full wholeness um, is experienced by every single person. It's the questions, finding the right words for those questions that will continue to push us toward that horizon. I wonder if in the play of your children, as you were talking about just being a kid, yeah. that there's this signal of uh, they're gesturing through their play to this queer horizon that yeah. you're talking about. I think we were all born naturally queer, you know, and then all the stuff of the systems and the structures around us, you know, from the beginning, they definitely tried to put us into those categories. Like as soon as they pull you out, you know, they tell you based on your genitalia, if you're a boy or a girl kind of thing. There's still this sense of like trying to um, escape those sort of norms and those um, those structures. There is to me something that hints at transcendence. So that, that sort of beautiful convergence of transcendence and imminence in a children, um, in a child's play is, is beautiful to me. Um, and I think, I think again, gestures towards queerness for us. You're in the church. You were raised in a very uh, fundamentalist uh, tradition, it seems, uh, very traditional uh, Korean Presbyterian fundamentalist tradition and at least gestured toward in more than that purity codes and all of these things which you talked about. So how do you bring this queer identity uh, to this church that you are so much a part of? Oh, that's tough, yeah. That's, uh, that's really, really tough. Um, 
the PCUSA is um, generally more progressive than um, a lot of other denominations. But the Korean churches hold on to very specific, or some of these more immigrant churches, but specifically speaking, Korean churches hold on to um, what they would say are more cultural um, ideologies, really. Mm -hmm. So notions about um, gender role, notions about family, um, responsibility, duties, um, and then again about sexuality, for sure. But I think people are definitely wrestling with um, the sort of heritage of being Asian in America, um, as well as Christian. And I think that there has to be some kind of letting go um, of uh, of something for there to be the production of something new. And so if we can just like get away from that pressure to have one expression of belief and that being an indicator of your Christian faith, then I feel like something beautiful will emerge. Um, something a lot more exciting, something more compelling, um, and something more powerful. What does it mean to be a part of a faith tradition that uh, is incarnate and has a crucifixion at its center. I think that notions of sacrifice, notions of suffering and death um, are, 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 are very um, present in Asian American communities. So if there's a way for us to give language to a crucifixion um, that expresses um, something about solidarity and um, a solidarity that's rooted in who Jesus is as both human and divine and, um, and uh, oriented towards us and our redemption and our wholeness, then I think that that, that at least will um, show us what it means to be moving towards or journeying to towards that, um, that queer horizon. Um, but what does it mean if all of us can look at um, Jesus as this example of someone who took on crucifixion um, not to glorify violence <laughs> or to glorify that particular kind of death, um, but as an expression of solidarity with humanity. When we understand what it meant for Jesus to be crucified and the fact that in being crucified, he was resisting standing over and against mm -hmm. uh, political ecclesiastical norms of his day, and so yeah. he was crucified. When we think about it in those terms, is Christianity at its core, at its center, with its central uh, symbol being a crucified Christ, is it queer, or does it need to be queered? I think there's always going to be a need for it to be queered. But for that to, to really happen at the level of church structures and church systems and what we know and understand as a church today, that um, we have to be willing to close the doors on some churches. We have to be willing to close the door on some of the, the structures that make the church what it is today as an institution. What does the movement of a queer Jesus look like in our world today? What would it look like? I think rereading those stories in the New Testament is a good start. That to me is definitely rooted in reading Jesus as queer. And so to think about um, his interactions, the way that he interfaced with people um, in those stories um, as an expression of queerness, um, if there's a way for us to um, model that and to embody that and follow that, um, to sort of re, re um, reconstruct a different sense of what discipleship looks like. So it's at the borders, it's, um, it's at the prisons, um, it's in those places that are hidden and invisible. To think about um, those folks who are not in the center, those folks who are marginalized, um, experience um, a particular kind of oppression on a regular basis, for those, um, those voices to be um, the ones that shape what we do and who we are. Um, and tell us how to be uh, the body of Christ in the world. So then, Mihi, you're a minister. What does, what does a queer ministry look like for you? I think a lot about sort of that tension between identity and vocation. Like, I think that um, our identities are very much rooted in and wrapped up in this work to care for, to love, to embody um, the presence of Christ. Um, but then there has to be some distance so that we're not only defined by that work, by that ministry, but that we're defined by um, being God's beloved. But we can't just be defined by our work, that we're defined first by who we are um, in God and the work that Christ did on the cross and um, the work that's continuously being done through the Spirit, 
um, and that our ministry and that our vocation then becomes um, a response of gratitude. I'm assuming in some ways when we talk about sort of this queer rise and it's queerness has to do with justice. Mm -hmm. What does a just earth look like? Hmm. Goodness. I mean, I just think about the basics, you know, in terms of everybody has enough to eat and everybody has clothes and shelter, that people aren't imprisoned, that people have health care, um, that people feel safe, um, that people can move and live in this world and through their bodies without fear. The basic everyday stuff of life, that that is going to be um, ultimately the expression of a just world where everyone has access, where everyone is safe and loved.